so uh, the title of my talk is Figures of Flandry in Gail Scott's Heroine. Uh, so in Gail Scott's Heroine, figures that reproduce the behaviors of the archetypal flaneur, the pensive gazing, the aimless wandering, and the immersed but distanced part participation in public life, uncover totalizing and homogenizing forces at play in the structuration of Montreal. In her palimpsestic and self-referential narrative montage of cuts and juxtapositions, Scott delineates Montreal's historical, ideological, and material foundations using wandering and observing figures. The, distance but, the distant but intimate witness postures of observers embodied by a racialized tourist observing the city from the summit of Mont Royal and a narrator navigating both queer and heterosexual relationships intrude into the lives of the novel's characters, whether they are battered revolutionaries gathered in cafes or sex workers whose voices describe the public and private spaces of the city. In what Eileen Miles refers to as a novel-like thing, Scott maps a fragmented city using wandering figures. This presentation explores how these figures of Flandry exploit the observed, traveled, and surveyed space to reveal gaps in discourses of homogenization and to create within this fragmented and sutured physical, political, and linguistic space, fluid and heterogeneous subjectivities. The Black Tourist, the first character readers encounter in Scott's novel and whose perspective and focus informs Scott and her readers' reading of Montreal, reproduces behaviors of the archetypal planner. The novel opens on the interpolation of the Black Tourist by a guard on top of Mont Royal. This interpolation is also policing the tourist's flannery as he attempts to put coins in a telescope at the Belvedere Mont Royal. So, so the citation, not practical, sorry. Uh, sir, you can only, and I quote, sir, you can only put Canadian money in that machine. No, sir, no foreign objects, no foreign money in that machine. It's an infraction, you see. The guard's finger runs tight under the small print. The wooden squirrels in the rafters are silent. The black tourist descends the steps with an astonished stare toward the telescope aimed at the city skyscraper, end of quote. The policing of the gesture meant to grant the black tourist the ability to observe the city to gaze at it with a bird's eye view, casts the guard as a foreign, foreigner in an English narrative. The guard's elongated and staccato enunciation in his interpolation of the black tourist blur the notions of foreign and domestic. Despite this interpolation and policing of the observatory, observatory gesture, the black tourist returns to the telescope and aims it at the city for the following pages. There, he charts a paradoxically intimate and distant portrait of the city. From afar, he zooms in on the lives of the novel's characters without physically encountering them. His flannerism operates away from the crowds in the busy market streets that are home to the Baudelarian flanner, and this position marks a shift in the representational dynamics produced by acts of flannery in the novel. The Black Tourist's observatory stance, ex stance exposes the city's literal and figurative whiteness as he, quote, sees the plain whiten beneath the skyscrapers. The city the black tourist observes it is uniform in its shape and in its color. It is a flat white plain, an obvious contrast to its skin color, which is emphasized in the text with the capitalization of the first letter of the word black. The recurrence of whiteness color coloring the city invades the lens through which both readers and the tourists see the cityscape. As the telescope cuts out a circle, as quote, the telescope cuts out a circle, end quote, the urban scene witnessed atop Mont Royal is, quote, whitening fast, for after midnight is November. This whitening of the plain, both the li literal and literary urban plain described by, by Scott, is subsequently undone at the level of narrative. In a self-referential writing gesture by Scott, the Black tourist talks back to the narrator of the novel and says, quote, you tell me, how would you treat me in a novel? Among other things, I bet at every mention you'd state my color, unquote, end quote. This address from the tourist to the novelist, the narrator, and by extension, the reader and critic is a discomforting one for all of these interpreters. At the ident as the identification of the tourist moves away from an interpolation to a neutral characterization, his standing as a tourist also crumbles. He is in fact depicted as waking up at the, at the Belvedere on Mont Royal, which would be a gesture that a tourist uh, doesn't do in, in, Mont in Montreal for those who don't know the city. So the tourist awakes with a start, I quote. The tourist awakes with a start. From the chalet loudspeaker comes an interminable waltz. Across the enormous room, the Canadian Olympic champion rowing team draped in maple leaves and posing for a picture. 
Let them eat cake, shouts a voice in the tourist's head, still partly from his dream. Now the present presidential candidate is on the radio. My fellow Americans, the good news is we've bummed the Russians. This turns out to be a joke. He didn't know the microphone was on. And now we'll have peace for our, for our nuclear weapons have wiped the place out. I should probably put the quote on, sorry. Uh, have wiped the place, uh, I've wiped the place up. To, to erase the horror, the tourist clutches at his throat, at his throat, trying to think of something nice, putting on the, the Ritz. He steps out into the sparse snowflakes again, a funny smile. Yes, tomorrow's winter. I love the solitude of white, end quote. As the tourist awakes on Mont Royal in, an half, in a half dream state, and before he steps out into the snow, the spectatorship exposes a surreal picture of nation and of the space of Canada. The, ro the rowers draped in maple leaves and Reagan's political gap compose an asphyxiating portrait of Canada, portrait of Canada in the 1980s. Trying to think of something nice, the tourist goes to put in on the Ritz, a, a song about bourgeois extravagancy and a notable performance of whiteness. The expression putting on the Ritz, meaning to put on fancy clothes and to put on a show for, for a public audience, recalls the image of the dandy, which has been reclaimed by African-American people and people of color to speak back to some of the codes of the white bourgeoisie. The flaneur is dependent upon these codes. According to Chantrell P. P. Lewis, the black dandy can be read as a sartorial maneuver used by black men to confront criminalizing stereotypes, widen conceptions about masculinity and create a new self-identity for the 21st century. Smiling, the black tourist is sartorial gesture in Scott's novel, Maps of City, where the cultural symbols and hegemonies of whiteness, Reagan, uh, Reagan and the Canadian flag are fluidly appropriated and ridiculed. The novel's writerly and self-reflexive gestures interlaced with, the fe with female and first subjectivities, and for the purposes of this paper, subjectivities traversed by the figure of the planner. As Scott herself explains in relation to the 1980s, when she was writing the novel, quote, if our force moteur was gender, still it did not put into question a larger solidarity with experimental male writers around a sense of writing from a semi-colonized space of partial failed revolution in resistance to the suppression of French culture in North America. And the inchoate notions of, of citizenship that resonated and that helped inform our production of partial or shared writing subjects. If heroine is a, an example of writing this partial subject, it also partially writes the flaneur as a conventional subject of the early 20th century. That is to say, heroine also responds to the notion of cosmo cosmopolitan citizenship transmitted in Baudelaire and Benjamin's idea of the flaneur. The wandering of the novel's characters and narrators are shaped by the, quote, partial failed revolution in resistance uh, in resistance, Scott refers to, and Montreal becomes a partial and failed cityscape that resists, quote, facile universalism and overgeneral to totalizing. In the novel, Montreal, quote, is a city of proliferating differences, its center already defined by competing codes because of its history of internal division. Montreal cannot generate the clear cut distinction between expatrié and impatrié, between foreign and native. This is both exemplified in the first excerpt mentioned in this presentation and when the narrator speaks back to her male partner. Quote, you say once more how macho and anachronistic North American cities are compared to Europe. However, you add the mixture of races make the makes the women truly beautiful. Fixing your eye on one of those blue black hair, one whose blue black hair and white skin may point to mixed French native ancestry. Unquote, end quote. Here, however, the juxtaposition of the narrator's partner's denunciation of North American cities, patriarchal and out of joint anachronistic atmosphere is juxtaposed to his male gaze, which observes the mixing of ancestries. Uh, yeah, skipping forward to uh, subjectivities, the, su the fluid subjectivities uh, the narrator explores therefore recall Benjamin's denunciation of a thesis that views the flaneur as a student of, quote, the physiognomic appearance of people in order to discover their nationality and social station, character and destiny from a perusal of their gait, build, and play features, end quote. The narrator as Flanois partially enacts the study of other subjects, but refrains from totalizing them and from drawing any conclusions. Maybe she thinks uh, they, do, they do not care. This carelessness may point to the anonymity of 
found in crowds, but it also redirects the narrator's own preoccupation about others. Maybe she should not care. However, the narrator embraces her own voyeurism. Quote, voyeur that I am, I want to go east, where the tiny restaurants and little red brick houses are as yet ungentrified. Last time on the Rue de la Visitation, I saw a courtyard opening vagina-like on a middle-aged woman tottering on platform heels, clown-faced and holding a balloon. The flaneuse's gaze writes the courtyard as a feminized, sexualized, embodied space in the city. By wandering in the city and by observing the cityscape around her, the narrator is learning to write the city anew, or as Scott herself calls it, to write quote, over the cusp of Montreal. A longer quote here. She crosses the street, at the fountain in the park, a man in a tuck, preaching something incomprehensible, holds out his arm to her. High, high above the drugstore stands a billboard with a little girl in a yellow raincoat on it. She ignores a quid, quick back black flash somewhere in her mind. Yes, she's pleased at how she's learning to write over the, over the top of things, whatever that means. Here, the narrator novelist is learning, but has not yet perfected the art of writing over things, not to erase with writing, but to write with what is under in, with what is under in mind. The multiplicity of sensations and, Im and Im images and the layering of actions, crossing the street, observing the man in the park, ignoring the flash in her mind, all point to a fluid and effective wandering, a wandering of the body in the city as text and of, the, and of text in the city as body. This excerpt exemplifies how, quote, Scott seeks out narrative devices that accentuate the subjective state of her narrator and create links with the flows and blockages of the city. The psychogeography of the city challenges and displaces city dwelling from a male-centric activity. According to Meredith Quartermain, quote, through the course of Scott's storyline, the narrator's imagined heroine moves from pessimism of paralysis in various patriarchal images of what she should do to be becoming an actor in her own drama. This parallels the narrator's gradual abandonment of her male lover and all the trappings of her dependency in patriarchy in favor of love between women, importantly. By challenging the pessimism of the patriarchal city, and, and you can recall the excerpt where the narrator speaks to her lover's pessimism about North American cities in contrast to European cities, the narrator claims flannerism to question the modern city. Her flannerism in this instance is, is queer because it involves fluid movement between lovers and sexual orientations. Uh, to conclude, Scott's heroine, uh, wanders through Montreal, it maps and unmaps, does and undoes, goes with and breaks the flows of this Canadian and semi-colonial city. Heroin exposes the flaneur as a fiction. In the novel, quote, ideologies are shown to be as fictional as novels when it comes to the real living bodies they act upon. The work of fiction is to undo assumptions about its limits, formalities, and frontiers with, with opposing terms, such as fact or reality. Its characters reenact this place and reclaim the ide ideology of the idealized figure of the flaneur. In fact, it is possible to read heroin as adding onto the notion of flaneur and to reuse Scott's idea of the comma to read the novel as some kind of translation of this notion in new terms. I've quote, I have come to think of the comma, and this is Scott speaking, uh, writing, I have come to think of the comma as representing the cusp of translation, the site of drifting identities. The various characters of the novel who drift through Montreal tend to enact the grammatical function of the comma. The tourist and the and narrator punctuate the narrative and interrupt the reading with their fluid wanderings. They give pause to homogenizing and totalizing mappings of the city. Thank you. <laughs>